It sounded to me like there was a general question about is it a problem that um, neural networks can learn too much? That they can learn unattested languages? Are there other explanations for the uh, observed language typology like, like Jason was suggesting? And I'd just like to get, um, if, if any of the, the people up here have thoughts on this general question, uh, maybe we could start there and then transition to other questions that people have. So. I, I, I agree with Jason that we don't have a uh, very strong evidence that people are unable to learn unnatural languages. And I think in phonology, uh, there have been experiments trying to show that uh, technologically where phenomena are harder to learn. And I think that that research program hasn't been very successful. Or maybe there was very, very slightly harder to learn. But um, you can get in an artificial language learning experiment, you can get people to learn pretty weird uh, and phonologically unnatural uh, languages. So yeah, I just we I, I don't know that we have strong evidence for for this. <laughs> if I can if I can refer yeah, to yeah. my own work again, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have an overview paper with with Elliot Morton that looks at this question, and we classify the types of things that people show bias towards oh, okay. in terms of substantive and structural biases. And so structural biases are clearly there in that mm -hmm. people have biases to learning structurally simple things. But they don't necessarily have biases towards learning only attested things. That's the way I would put that literature. But yeah, yeah thanks. Yeah, that's a good point, though, Tom. Yeah. 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 Well, the yeah. problem uh, that I believe will be talked about in a session that you and Elliot are organizing at this meeting, at the uh, LSA meeting, um, is that um, it's not at all plausible that these kind of learning networks uh, are useful models of uh, conscious rule learning. Mm -hmm. Completely not. And so whenever you do an experiment, there is the confound of are people doing conscious rule learning? Uh, in which case, whatever they learn, you wouldn't expect to be modeling with the network. Uh, or are they doing what maybe we tend to think of as some kind of uh, more automatic unconscious uh, learning of the sort that we would imagine uh, first language learning involves as opposed to second language learning. Ha so then we need the experiments to tell us which uh, types of languages the intuitive process as opposed to the conscious one yeah. can learn. I, I guess that I have a lot more confidence in those results more generally. I would say broadly, even in spite of the possible contributions of explicit knowledge. I do think that what has been productive, um, an apparently productive research program has been to look at the constraints that arise in iterated learning contexts. So when there's communities of language users working together and the constraints that emerge over those processes. And so I think that, and there's lots of people I think probably here that can talk to that a lot better than I can, but I think that um, looking, I think that a lot of the constraints on these types of operations are going to come from what is stable in communities of perceiving and producing agents rather than from restrictions on the agents themselves and the types of properties they can learn. How that explanation exactly works, I don't know. Other people might, but it could explain, for example, string reversals. I'm not really sure what property of communities rules that out, but. We should uh, try the iterated learning experiment. We That's a good idea. Exactly. <laughs> Anything else from the people up front on, on this general topic? Well, maybe one small thing is that um, I think that um, RNNs can be a useful tool, even if uh, they're not a useful cognitive model. And I think that the uh, addressing issues like the poverty of the stimulus is one example, which where the, um, it's more general than humans are not able to learn from this data. It's, this data just doesn't have any information about this phenomenon. So there you can, even if the model is completely cognitively impossible, you can still use it to probe whether there is any information in the input. Um, so. But again, I want, I want to push on that, because really as a, as a useful sort of learning model, we need to be able to understand the biases of the learner. And I feel like we understand neural networks so poorly, they're a very bad sort of uh, white box model for us to sort of probe because we have to then 
we train them perfectly easily, and then we have no idea what they're doing and how they're doing it. And I mean, I know you've worked with some on trying to peer inside this black box a little bit. We've all, you know, those of us who work on these things spend a lot of time. But I don't know, this really bothers me because we, you know, hear things like, oh, neural networks are just, you know, predicting what's in the data. Well, no, they're not. They're, they have biases. They favor uh, sequential recency. You know, when they encode a hierarchy, we have a lot of trouble figuring out how they're actually even coding that. So, I don't know. I guess I'm going to push back on that a little bit. I feel like we need, we need them, but we need alternatives. Uh, we don't just want to have say here's the one or one recurrent neural network that we use. We need to have a family of them yeah. that we uh, kind of have different aspects that we can ablate, turn on, and see what uh, what sort of uh, um, behavior changes. And that's that's a sort of better methodological paradigm. Yeah, there's some great work on um, one of the big mind uh, developing this uh, kinds of models. You should you should look into. It. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I I don't know who, Sam, maybe I saw your hand first. Yeah, I'll just kind of... Uh, maybe we should keep with the names as Sam Bowman, yeah. NYU. <laughs> um, I'll kind of push back on half of that pushback. Um, I, I totally agree that these, these results are, are much more convincing and in a lot of cases really only correct if you're, reason, if you're able to show that kind of learners with relatively different biases are able to pick up the same signal, um, especially if you, don't, if you can't easily describe the biases. But I do think that RNNs, uh, that sort of results on RNNs alone do have a, a reasonable place here. Um, only because I think, it's, I think it, is, it is fair to say, based on what we know, that they don't have any strong biases towards sort of hierarchical structure of the sort that you see in syntactic structures. And so if, we're, if, we, if we see them learning structure that is very straightforwardly described in these terms, I think that, I think you can make a not completely bulletproof, but very strong argument that that structure is, there is ample evidence for that structure in the data. Uh, I um, <clears throat> don't want to harp on this too much, but uh, it's possible um, with uh, tensor product representations to do things which amount to uh, sort of innate uh, preference for uh, recursive representations, um, and <clears throat> that really involves uh, re restrictions on what kind of uh, operations get performed, what kind of weight matrices transform these things, uh, and you can write down those requirements. They're very uh, simple and transparent, uh, and so I think it's not out of the question that you could uh, set up <coughs> set of constraints which are architecturally uh, stable in neural network type terms, um, which do predispose uh, the system to be using binary trees as its representational medium, uh, which of course then opens the door to hopefully generalizations that are sensitive to that structure. Yeah, I would I guess just to come back to what Chris was saying about kind of having hierarchies of models, right? What actually generates behavior is not just some RNN, but an RNN and a particular training set and a particular optimization algorithm. Um, and that, you know, when we talk about these things having biases toward learning one thing or another, you know, in some ways it might be more informative to say, well, on the basis of 10 examples, at a level of training accuracy of 90% or 50% or whatever. What are the kinds of predictions that it's making instead? Because you know, probably you can get uh, any of these kinds of models to learn anything given enough examples. But the interesting thing is what you can do with limited data. I know this is a slight, slight veering off topic so, uh, from what we were just talking about. But if you are, I was really struck by the sort of one of the closing points of the last talk about like, hey, you know, we can use RNNs to really investigate you know, sort of blank slate versus adding in vector biases. And I'm thinking, you know, which is something I'm really interested in, but if, I'm, if, you're, if you're someone who's like, yeah, okay, I want to investigate adding this inductive bias or this inductive bias versus nothing, why do I want to use an RNN instead of like the old symbolic model of choice? Like what's the, what, what are the scenarios where I'm like, ah, this is when I want to use an RNN as opposed to a symbolic model that's much more interpretable? Yeah, I mean, I maybe not just to you, but to yeah. <laughs> I think one of our big motivations in using RNNs was just that, looking at the NLP community, RNNs are doing so ridiculously well in so many yeah. linguistic tasks, and we don't have a good idea of why. Mm -hmm. That it seems like, you know, given the fact that they're outperforming many, perhaps more principled linguistic models, 
it seems like they must be getting something right. Um, maybe not necessarily, but there's a good chance that they're getting something right about um, representing the structure of the language. And it would, would be really nice to understand what it is that they're getting right. So maybe why. it's more like the stuff that Paul talked about. It's like this is giving you inspiration for what those inductive, inductive biases might be. Like, if, you know, we don't have a really strong idea of like what a particular inductive bias, we feel that there's more there by looking at what a really good performing RNN could do. We could say, ah, maybe it's that, how would we interpret that? Is that kind of Is that comprehensible? Sorry. Yeah. It's, it's always struck me, I have to say, as, as a bit strange in general in the neural network community that there's a tremendous focus. It, it comes from this, I guess, intuition that the, there are these things that are highly continuous and they are not really good at doing categorical things. So we need to focus a lot of attention on categorical things. But it's also the case that there are tremendous amounts of linguistic behavior and data that are uh, d continuous in various types of ways and dynamic. And so it seems to me like actually the, the, the questions that might be most productively analyzed by using neural networks are ones that actually require making reference to both categorical and continuous <laughs> phenomena. Otherwise, it's a question of why wouldn't you, there might be, it's, it might be simpler to approach a tool, a better tool would be one that is discrete yeah. entirely. I, maybe I said something in the fence term. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I, I, I wanted to respond sort of to your, both, both of the previous comments. I mean, I guess, so you were saying that, you know, there, there must be something that neural networks are, are doing right. Um, and I think that there's an interesting question there, which is, you know, so far what we've been talking about is structure. Um, but to me, the thing that neural networks are really doing right is similarity. Yes. Um, and I think that's why they do so well in NLP. Um, now, I'm not sure that anyone has necessarily explicitly tried to tease those two things apart. It's like, you know, if you do well enough on similarity, does it kind of make up for the fact that you're maybe not doing so well on structure? Um, and I think that in NLP, that might be the case. Because, of course, what NLP cares about is things that happen a lot. Um, and what linguistics cares about, well, not entirely, but to a large extent, is things that don't happen a lot. Um, so, you know, and I think maybe similarity helps a lot when you're sort of worrying about things that are very frequent. Um, so anyway, so I, I think that that's something that, you know, hasn't been mentioned yet, but I think the question, you know, to what extent is similarity something that's important for explaining language? I think that's a really important question. Um, you know, so that, that might be just something to put on the table as well. I don't have any strong opinion on how uh, the recurrent neural networks can introduce them. Allow me, please. Okay. I don't have any strong opinion <laughs> on how recurrent neural networks have some inductive bias. But regarding the ability of uh, handling the uh, hierarchical structures, I think we need to uh, look into the classical studies on dynamic automata and some classical investigation of the representation that the recurrent neural networks develop. And uh, all the recurrent neural networks can be viewed as a type of iterative function map system. So that kind of system usually develops the fractal encoding of the structures. So somehow, if we investigate the relationship between the states after processing different symbols, then typically uh, there exists some self-similarity between those things. So that may be. Uh, the reason why the RLMs is so good at dealing with uh, hierarchical structures. But I don't know if anyone actually really tries to investigate the representation from the more recent version of the RLM, something like LSD. There's a really good paper I can draw your attention uh -huh. to from uh, Joab Goldberg and colleagues mm -hmm. from Bar Ilan uh, that uh, quantizes these states and RNNs and looks at them. Uh, uh, as deterministic finite automata and shows you can actually recover the DFA that was used to generate the, the training data. And these are just uh, sort of, is it in the language, is it out of the language? They have some interesting results where uh, they actually fit uh, some, uh, they sort of overfit the data often in the RNN and uh, during the course of extracting this quantized uh, DFA version of it, they actually find the right grammar, but then sort of continue on and sort of overfit to the yeah. sort of uh, 
contingencies of the, of the data they trained on, which is a really interesting result. Um, but obviously, the thing to keep in mind is these are uh, DFAs at the end of the day. I mean, they're just really, really, really big state spaces, yes. but they are DFAs. <coughs> Uh, this is a new topic, I, that's all right. Uh, just about all the talks were mostly about syntax, uh, but I was curious about what might be the role of uh, syntactic theory uh, in what you're doing, and maybe I could give a, a little bit of background. Uh, I came to syntactic theory in 1973 as a very young person and was thrilled and was very excited uh, to imagine what the syntax of the future would be like that uh, the grammars would work perfectly. We would predict native speaker judgments so that the linguist would know the native speaker's response, possibly ambivalent, before they even elicited uh, the sentence. Uh, well, that was actually 45 years ago. Uh, and it doesn't seem to have happened yet. That uh, <laughs> syntax is uh, written into different frameworks. And some syntactic syntacticians, when I talk to them, say, we have no hope of producing a complete grammar of a language. We focus on individual problems that might be illuminating. So to make this into a question, uh, is this a fair assessment? And are you perhaps trying to leapfrog over the dilemmas of theory? Or might your work somehow be caused to relate to syntactic theory and, and advance it? <laughs> I can throw out a reference that might be useful here, um, except that I'm not remembering. <laughs> the, 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 the paper I'm trying to remember is the one that was did um, acceptability judgments, um, gradient acceptability judgments with different models, and R and Ns are the are the winners. Lao. Lao. Yeah. Thank you. Lao. Uh, First author is Lao. So this is a paper from 2017 where they're modeling grammaticality judgments, syntactic grammaticality judgments. Um, they're training a learner on a corpus. And right, Bruce, it, it's, not a, it's not a generative grammar model that's winning. It's an RNN. It's just one of these RNNs that doesn't have any structural biases, hierarchical structural biases built into it. So to me, that's a, that generative linguists should see that as a challenge. They should say, wait, we, we believe there is hierarchical structure. We need to build models that have hierarchical structures and can do better on these sorts of tasks. So that's maybe just a, I'm, I'm uh, continuing on your question, maybe taking it in a different direction as well. Well, <coughs> um, picking up uh, on Sharon's introduction of the notion of similarity and how perhaps that's uh, a very large part of the success uh, of uh, the current generation of neural network models, um, uh, a a guiding principle behind the uh, construction of, of TPRs was precisely to try to combine the capabilities of structure with the capabilities of similarity. Uh, and so uh, to the extent that um, we can uh, learn something about what these recurrent networks are learning about similarity, uh, then we might be able to incorporate that into uh, a framework where we have stru structure available as well. Um, and the research program is all about trying to pull up to the symbolic level of everything that can be. And so should that make progress, the hope would be that it would lead to some sort of uh, new syntactic formalisms at the symbolic level, which might go beyond what uh, the current, um, I'm not sure what word to call the state of syntactic theory, but whatever that is. <laughs> 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 To pop back to Bruce's question, um, I am not a syntactician, but I would say that um, one hope that we've had is that 
there might be progress given on certain types of problems that boil down to does a, a given, is, is something associated with structure A or B? And in turning that into, it's associated to two structures simultaneously in weighted degrees of combination. So we've looked at that, um, uh, my postdoc Laura Brem, former postdoc Laura Brem looked at this in the context of verb particle constructions, arguing that we could see graded degrees of association between the particle and the verb in different types of syntactic configurations. And so that's another way in which um, we could maybe think about enriching the notion of syntactic representations and then seeing what types of grammars could be defined over the <coughs> syntactic representations. Yeah, the liaison analysis was born exactly out of that uh, situation where there was a long-standing disagreement as to whether in petit ami the T is part of petit or whether it's part of ami, and uh, the proposal that I was describing is they're both. It's both, but that can only work if it's gradiently both. Um, and so the analysis I propose can be described literally as a linear combination of two analyses that were uh, the subject of a many decade long dispute. Uh, and so one could imagine as in particle for particle constructions and um, Majun is looking at uh, complement versus adjunct distinctions where long standing disputes can uh, exist. Uh, the uh, question is whether by blending analyses using blended representations, we can um, finesse some of these dead ends that uh, are everywhere in linguistic theory, not just syntax. Uh, yeah, uh, Jason Lesbridge on time. Uh, so th this makes me wonder about whether you'd want to do something similar for other cases in language where two analyses seem to be simultaneously present. Uh, I'm thinking specifically of uh, uh, analyses in combinatorial categorial grammar uh, where you could see a sentence as being a subject plus a verb phrase or a uh, sentence missing an object together with the object, which you need for non-constituent coordination and extraction. Uh, so the standard picture in CCG is that both those things are uh, valid analyses. So you have spurious ambiguity uh, in a standard SVO sentence uh, because both of them give rise to the same semantic interpretation. Uh, and you're forced to pick one analysis or the other in cases where coordination or extraction uh, means that the other one is not present as a contiguous constituent. Uh, so there's always been a problem in uh, probabilistic treatments of CCG uh, in the, if these things are both right, you don't exactly want to treat it as a latent variable where you say, well, maybe it's this analysis, maybe it's that analysis. You want to say that they're actually both right. And I wonder if uh, GSA would have something to say about that. Absolutely. I mean, the sense in which we're talking about uh, mixtures of symbols in these blends. We're careful to call them blends because crucially, the two parts are present simultaneously. They're co-present. It's a conjunctive combination, whereas probabilistic mixtures are disjunctive combinations. And so there are many situations where the evidence um, uh, is not going to be resolved by saying, well, you can pick A or you can pick B. You're going to have to be able to get A and B to work simultaneously together somehow. Um, and uh, this case that you're talking about is very similar to something that Najon Kim is looking at for subject, uh, for uh, complement adjunct um, ambiguities, so in CCG. The, the other case that comes to mind are things like puns uh, or cases where multiple, in music, uh, where multiple parses, like if you think of something in 6A, you're simultaneously hearing uh, duple and triple rhythm. And but I don't know whether that's a blend or if it really is disjunctive and uh, the fact that you're doing having the necro cube effect is part of what's pleasurable uh, mm -hmm. aesthetically. I uh, have a comment to make about Bruce's question, just yeah. a comment on that question. So, um, my understanding of that, uh, the, the paper that yeah. you mentioned, that um, a lot of the success of the model there is because of the confounds in the materials, where there often there's a bigram uh, that's extremely low probability bigram in an ungrammatical sentence, but you can easily make it into uh, a, you know, un unbounded, uh, you could put an unbounded material in the middle and then can throw off those language yeah. models. Yeah. Um, and in my, we, we have um, been doing a little bit of uh, getting accessibility judgments from language models and, you know, this 
more with more careful experimental design and they're, they're not yeah they're they're not nearly uh, right. where you would like them to be it's not like you, right. you, you can just uh, take an RNA and predict all human excitability judgments uh, right. on what like after unsupervised training on a corpus maybe if you do some very complicated um, stuff but yeah I mean maybe one day we'll be able to have a like a, a broad coverage model of excitability judgments but I don't think we'll just have that out of the box with RNA right, right. Now. Yeah. Good, good. Um, yeah, just one more question so we can have a, a, a couple minutes to, to stretch before the next. We have, in fact, the, the perceptrons and syntactic structures session is, is ending, and then we're having Bruce Hayes talk for skill. Um, c do you have a quick question, Christine? <laughs> Go ahead, yeah, yeah. That's output strings as it looks like um, you're doing, it's not always clear that you can rule out that there's some kind of grammar, for instance, a hierarchical related one producing this map because you could have any other kinds of other grammars, especially when you're working with, let's say, a finite training set, a finite uh, length of strings to produce and so forth. Like you could get center embedding up to some finite bound. Um, and so I guess what I'm wondering is it looks like maybe there are some ways you can look at neural nets to not just look at the map from the input to the output, but also perhaps look at the actual, you know, for instance, of trees, the derivation process and steps of the derivation. I'm wondering if that's what these DFAs and some things that Paul was mentioning about binary trees, if that's something that, that we can look at too. Does anyone have a, qu a quick answer? Yes? <laughs> I was just going to say it relates back to the fractal encoding that we yeah, were talking yeah. about. Right? That the, the types of structures that emerge and that have this self-similarity property that then actually tend to lead to uh, organizations of the state space that have this, uh, not finite limits, but real, really down to uh, precision limits in terms of the representation. I don't know if that is transparent enough in 30 seconds. No. Okay. <laughs> okay, we, be we better take a little break. Um, thank